Okay, let me get this stuff out of the way. Yes, he has been voted Canada's sexiest MP six years running in a newspaper that I suppose considers itself a political paper of record, the Hill Times. But Peter McKay, our current Minister of Defense, former Minister of Foreign Affairs, has recently got married. He's off the market. He married a, a current human rights activist and former Miss World Canada, a woman named Nazanin Afshin Jam. The wedding presided over by a reverend from Nova Scotia, where Peter has represented the people in the House of Commons since 1997. Uh, in a way, Peter's following in the footsteps of his father, Elmer, who was once a Tory cabinet minister himself. Peter was once a part of a handful of young politicians who were regarded as the future of the Progressive Conservative Party. But that future became increasingly dark with the waning fortunes of the PCs post Mulroney and into the late 90s and the rise of the Reform Party in the West. Peter saw the writing on the wall, and he became one of the architects of the new Conservative Party of Canada, even rose to the rank of deputy leader under Stephen Harper. But he has run into some trouble recently, faced questions over his travel tab, involved a much-talked-about helicopter ride and a certain football game. And with the mission in Libya wrapped, and with our combat troops now out of Kandahar, it's up to Peter to help define what role Canada's forces will continue to play on the world stage. Please welcome the Minister of National Defense, the Honorable Peter McKay. Hi, bud. Thanks for seeing me. Hello. I'm doing well. Good to see you. Good to see you. Thanks. Um, it's been, you know, crazy, man. It's been like 10 years since I was leaning up against the House of Commons when you first walked up to me long before you were this guy. We just started right. talking about music. I remember seeing you standing there and uh, just walked over. We had a good chat. And uh, you have some very eclectic interests in music, I remember. I really do. As do you. <laughs> Thanks for coming on today, though, man. That's a pleasure. I've, I've been really excited about coming on the show. And uh, being on the same show as uh, Philippe Faridot yeah. is, uh, is equally exciting. I mean, a, a great Canadian success story, Oscar nominee. Mm -hmm. So, uh, real thrill for me to be here. And I'm sorry I couldn't get here sooner. We had a little, uh, yeah, that's right. little issue with the weather yeah, last week. I tried that to... happens in winter in Canada. I've heard that. I tried to get you to charter a jet. You wouldn't do it. No, <laughs> no you I'm know what? Come on, get but, one. Uh, <laughs> but thanks for putting that helipad on the roof. You like that? <laughs> <laughs> well, actually, it's for Don Cherry and Mansbridge. So we just thought maybe yeah, you could actually... <laughs> I know. I can't carry their bags. No. I'm sorry. <laughs> um, so, I mean, there's lots to talk about, obviously, especially in an important position like yours when we've been involved in military conflict. So post-Afghanistan and now with whatever's happening in Libya with us, what do you see Canada's role in terms of international defense? Well, you know, Canada has played a, a critical role, uh, a very important one that I think has, uh, in my view, caused an awakening in Canada about military service, about the value of what we contribute to the world and what we bring to the fight, to be very frank with you. Uh, we have men and women in uniform uh, in harm's way that have uh, performed heroically uh, and they stand on the shoulders of greatness as you know in this country uh, I feel like I have sometimes the best job in government I get to deal with our best citizens mm -hmm. and see firsthand their patriotism uh, their passion for what they do they uh, they are incredibly motivated Canadians and uh, you mention Afghanistan Libya more recently uh, we saw the humanitarian component of what we bring uh, in Haiti uh, and all over the world. We're, we're in 16 different missions right now as we speak. But with something like, like Afghanistan where the reason for being there, it seemed to be a moving target. There was always different explanations as to why we were there. Um, and you could see a different perspective of the war because, yes, absolutely, no one would de deny that what the soldiers are doing are fantastic, like being great citizens. However why were there's changed a lot and I think a lot of people started to have a little bit of distrust well there's there's a component of, of what you said uh, of defense of North America right we're there in common cause 60 different countries NATO allies UN backed mission and 9-11 uh, of course was the impetus for much of the decision to go but you're right the mission evolved and uh, what we saw happen was Canada deploy into Kandahar province which was the the spiritual homeland of the Taliban a very, very difficult part of the country, to say the least. And let's not forget, the country itself was run by a terrorist organization, the Taliban, yeah. in cohorts with Osama bin Laden. And, and we know, we know the evolution of, of the mission, and now we've, we've transitioned to training. But I want to tell you an interesting story. I was uh, speaking to a Dutch general who was, was the regional commander uh, in Kandahar when Canada was deployed. And he said, you know, I get asked a lot why are Dutch soldiers giving their lives in Afghanistan? Why are we there? He said, I expect you get asked the same question. I said, of course. He said, I give the same answer 
to citizens in the Netherlands when I get asked every time. He said, when I'm asked, why are Dutch soldiers in Afghanistan? I said, why were Canadians in our country in 1945? Right. And there's an element of liberation, of common values, of helping the Afghan people in a way that goes beyond the military. Because we enabled schools to be built, children to be educated, children to be vaccinated, women to have greater human rights. And those are fundamental beliefs that we share with, with all countries. When you leave, when we leave, and other countries leave, there's a lot of people, there are a lot of people there who say that it is just going to revert back. What, do, what has to happen for the mission to not be deemed in vain? Well, that, that's the question. That's the quintessential question. Will the Afghan government be able to assume the capacity? Uh, and that's why we're still there. And we shouldn't ever forget, and Canadians should be well aware that we still have almost a thousand soldiers there in, in Kabul now, in a different region of the country, different static bases, training Afghan security, so police and army, to do what we've been doing for them, to give them that ability to defend their borders, to defend their communities, their people, uh, and then we can get on with some of the other work that, that obviously has to be done, the humanitarian work. But their government is now being asked, assume this responsibility. And, so and they're do you, doing so. So what do you do, though? Like, the decision in Afghanistan, we get at post 9-11. Why Libya? Why not Syria? What are the conversations that happen? And why not Congo? Why not other parts of the world? Well, A number one, UN Security Council resolution. Why Libya, not Syria? Uh, number two, there was a, a willingness of the people on the ground in Libya, in that particular instance, to assume much of the responsibility, much of what was happening, I would describe it as much more advanced than what's happening in Syria. Syria is very troubling. It's, uh, an, it's an extremely distressing situation for everyone to see on the nightly news, the, the human rights abuses, uh, president uh, of that country inflicting uh, the terrible atrocities that we've, you know, we've seen in other countries, quite frankly, in, including Libya. So. Um, other efforts, including diplomatic, including pressures, same, same tact that we're on, I would suggest, in, uh, in Iran. Uh, those alternatives to military action are always preferable, always preferable. But there is something called the responsibility to protect, yeah. of so which Canada was, uh, was a very uh, you know, important country in bringing that forward at the UN. Well, I hear you talking about UN. We pick and choose what we want to be involved with with the UN, though. So, you know, we decide if, if we want to acknowledge this resolution. Well, it's not a that. perfect organization. Right. You know, uh, as Churchill said about democracy, it's, it's the worst except compared to all the others. Mm -hmm. and, and it does work. You know, on occasion, I think the UN has had its shining moments. But it's a flawed organization. It, it's reliant on, uh, uh, on humans. All right, so with all this on your plate, when you knew that story was going to break about the chopper ride, you knew that story was going to break about spending, how did you feel when you knew that was coming out? Well, you know, I, I look at that and I say, I, uh, I do everything I can to be with soldiers, with their families, with people associated with the department. That's my responsibility. I got a call that said, we need you in Ontario. Uh, there's an important announcement happening with respect to General Dynamics, mm -hmm. $34 million. This was in the, the height of the recession, the downturn that was going on. And I was on time off. And the call said, you got to be there tomorrow. Yeah. I said, I can't do it. Uh, we looked around. We said, uh, there, is, there is an opportunity here to do a search and rescue demonstration at the same time, something that, uh, again, I've, I've uh, tried to do in spending time with the military. And uh, so we made it happen. But I use government assets to do government work. So how do you and feel when it comes out, though? Like, because you, you know that. I mean, I, I don't know if you know where it comes from or who knows where that stuff comes from. But it, it just seems political at the time. Well, look, I, I've I've been in opposition. Uh, I know how it works. Have you I, done I, stuff like that before? Like, well, you know, I think there's always been issues that come up that uh, are hot topics at the time. I mean, this was an easy one, right? Yeah. I mean, it, it's easy to make fun of. Yeah. But uh, the truth of the matter is. You know, those assets are, are used for a, a specific purpose. And uh, whether it's visiting our troops in Afghanistan, which I've, I've done numerous times, mm -hmm. seeing them at sea in the Mediterranean, uh, where they train, where they live, where they work, uh, I feel that's a primary responsibility that I have to work with them and to see firsthand and to hear from them directly what they need to do their job. The guy who carries the gun, yeah. uh, the people who are at the sharp end of what Canada's national defense is all about. That's my primary role. All right, stick around. More with Peter McKay right after this. As you can probably tell, we have a live studio audience. I'd love it if you would join us. Go to strombo.com slash tickets for more.
McKay came off at half and the floodgates opened for the Thunder as they scored five second half tries for a final score of 49 to five. Paul Forrest scored the lone Nova Scotia try. For me, this is a bit of a swan song to come out and play a, a game for my province. It, it was uh, a real honor. We're back here with the defense of the city of Peter McKay here playing rugby, you know. So, Morgan Williams, yep. former captain of Canada from Cole Harbour, Nova Scotia, Sidney right Crosby's there. hometown. And uh, my rugby career ended in a very, uh, uh, let's say, a crash. Uh, <laughs> the captain, a former captain of Canada, Al Sharon from Ottawa, broke my arm really? in a game on Parliament Hill. Liberal, the, New Democrat, uh, or Conservative? Uh, <laughs> independent. Independent. Oh, my God. You guys and your independence. You know, when you, by the way, when he left the field after playing that, 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 his rivals turned it on. Do you feel like they were holding back playing you just a little uh, bit? I don't think they were holding back at all. <laughs> <laughs> the, um, so, so when I told my friends you were coming on the show, for some reason everybody was like, oh, so we can talk about his marriage? Oh, we got married. And I thought, I don't really just normally get that caught up in a politician's marriage, but because uh, your partner has profile and for some reason people are interested in it, how are you going to balance that part of it? Uh, very carefully, and uh, and with a lot of input from Nazanin. Yeah. You know, I, I'm really happy, George. You you've met her. You've yeah. had her on your show. I'm not going to jump on your furniture like Tom Cruise, but I'm <laughs> I'm uh, I'm really happy about yeah. it. You know, and uh, and at the same time, you know, I, I want to try to protect my my private life. Our community back in Nova Scotia has been so welcoming to her, um, and a lot of interest in in what she does. She's a very dynamic woman. Uh, who has done a lot of work uh, internationally. I mean, her, her, mm -hmm. her life's work really revolves around uh, saving children on death row. I mean, can you imagine a country that still stones underage children to death in some cases? Right. And she has been successful in uh, extracting killed children from that, uh, that horrible end. And so I, I really, I have such admiration for her. And I met, I met her through work, yeah. but we're now uh, very much aware that we have to keep work separate. How does a defense minister pick somebody up at a work event? <laughs> like, what do you do? Is it, it kind did, of... It didn't happen like that. Really, no? let, let me assure well, you. Did you go on Facebook and start with a poke? And then like, how did that, <laughs> like a, a direct, how does that happen? <laughs> How do you use protection in, the, in that situation? <laughs> yeah, fair I enough, yeah. I, you can't. I, uh, <laughs> look, we, we, we met professionally and then we kept in touch over yeah. a period of time and she's been working on a book, which comes out in March. You know, I think like a lot of good relationships, uh, it was a friendship that, that evolved. And by the way, your mother asked me to mention to you that, you know, it's, it's time, it's the pressure's <laughs> on, you know. No. Hey, somebody booed. <laughs> Man, it's all the girls in Canada. No, I mean, no, you're, no. You're, a, you're a household name. No, now, no. a household name people can't spell, That's but true. a household name <laughs> nonetheless. That's true. I was thinking about you when I was covering this, this whole demise of the Liberal Party, and I went, you know, you had to step into the Conservative Party when they were pretty beat up. Can you empathize with what they're going through right now? Absolutely. And, and you know, uh, one of the questions that's been out there is, you know, should they merge with the NDP? And this is something that, that happened with the Progressive Conservative Party, the Alliance Party of Canada. And it's made politics, in my view, more competitive. Yeah. That we have, you know, these, these parties that are, are competitive. And so, you know, if I could be completely nonpartisan, yeah. um, that's probably something that the left should, should take a good look at. Uh, because, uh, you know, I think we need a competitive democracy that keeps government on its toes. It, it keeps the country healthy. You want them to merge? Well, I, I'm not going to give them yeah. advice, uh, but, uh, you know, I, I think they could do uh, a lot worse than take a serious look at the advantages of working together because it defines the debate clearly. But, you know, that's a, that's a decision for another polit two political parties, and, uh, you know, I'm, I'm quite happy where we are today. Minister of National Defense, the Honorable Peter McKay, everybody. We'll be right back.